Greetings, and welcome back to the channel as we continue to dive into the world of science fiction cinema. We're halfway through the decade. In the 1930s, the center of cinema continued to shift towards Hollywood. Sound was the norm, and interest in color film was building. The science fiction films of the year range in quality and storytelling techniques. From a Soviet critique of capitalism to the usual combinations with horror in one of Universal's best films, to yet another remake of a 1913 German novel. Robots were featured in two films. There were lots of gadgets, a singing cowboy, an American serial so bad that Universal pulled it before it could be released in theaters. So here are the good, the bad, and the forgotten films of 1935. Of the eight sci-fi films from 1935, I'd like to start with the ones made outside the United States. The Soviet film Loss of Sensation, also known as R.U.R., Robot of Jim Ripple, was directed by Alexander Andreevsky and written by Grigory Grebnev. This film is mistakenly associated with Kirill Chapik's 1920 play, R.U.R., Rossum's Universal Robots, due to the robots in the film also using the R.U.R. logo. Both works involve robots replacing humans. The play is best known as the work that originated the term robot. The film presents a negative portrayal of the robot concept, unlike Chapek's more optimistic view. Loss of Sensation is actually based on the 1929 novella by Ukrainian Volodymyr Vladko. The film stars Sergei Vyshenslov as Jim Ripple, an engineer living in an unnamed capitalist country who constructs a robot under the guise of aiding workers who are not able to keep up with factory demands. But Jim wants to use these robots to undermine the capitalist businessmen. And of course, the government becomes interested in his creation for military purposes, since they lack autonomy and can be controlled by radio unlike people. During a workers' strike, robots replace workers, leading to armed conflict between the workers and the military. The film ranges from comical to thoughtful, especially from a contemporary perspective. Jim demonstrates his robot to investors by showing it dance to music while Jim plays on his saxophone. With the Soviet filmmakers setting the story in a capitalist country, we can see what they thought of the West at the time. This world is not the communist utopia of the Soviet Union that they so claimed to publicly be in the 1930s. The idea of robots will become a staple of science fiction film and television. We've seen glimpses of this in the 1920s and 30s with Chapek's play, as well as 1921's The Mechanical Man, 1927's Metropolis, and it was a plot point in 1934's The World Without a Mask. We'll also look at how the powerful use robots in a later chapter in this episode. How could robots be used in the right or wrong hands? In 1935, they were mere tools rather than sentient creatures. These are all topics that will be delved into in later sci-fi films. There are some good ideas and visuals, especially in the last 30 minutes, but the acting is stilted and the editing is questionable. It doesn't get interesting until the last portion of the film during the uprising of the workers. The idea of Soviet workers as good and capitalism as bad does hit too hard on the nose. The visuals are influenced by Soviet montage theory and German expressionism. However, it is a cheap imitation of much better films. Loss of Sensation is available on DVD and YouTube, and I'll link it in the description below. Before continuing with the films of 1935, if you are enjoying the content, please give the video a thumbs up and subscribe for more History of Sci-Fi episodes. Your support is what keeps this channel thriving, and I'm thankful for everyone stopping by and sharing the love of this amazing genre. The Dead Speak is considered the first Mexican science fiction feature film. It is a mix of genres ranging from mystery to horror, 
and very little sci-fi other than the contraptions used by the main character to prove his theories. Directed by Gabriel Soria and written by Soria as well as Emilio Fernandez, it is based on the novel by Pedro Zapian. The Dead Speak tells the story of a controversial professor who builds a device that can record the last image a person sees before they die. Working with the one student who hasn't abandoned him, they hope to solve murders in the town. This concept, known as optography, where the eye captures the last image seen before death, was from the late 19th and early 20th century, but never showed real results. In 1888, a British detective wanted to use optography to identify Jack the Ripper, using one of his victims. In 1914, a forensic optomogram was considered as evidence in a murder case, though the suspect was later acquitted. There is very little information about the film, and I was only able to find a Spanish-language version for a review. It is a curious mix of genres, none of which gel into a compelling story. But it is always fun to watch the first science fiction film from a particular country, and if you are interested in Mexican filmmaking, I recommend checking it out. The Dead Speak is available for free on YouTube, and I'll link it in the description below. Der Tunnel, a 1913 novel by Bernhard Kellerman, was adapted into German feature films in 1915 and 1933, a French version in 1933, and now as an English language version from the United Kingdom. Director Maurice Elvey, a prolific director who helmed the 1929 sci-fi film I Treason, brought us Transatlantic Tunnel, also known as The Tunnel and was written by FP1 and Tortet Nix, Kurt Siomak. Starring Oscar nominee Richard Dix, as well as Leslie Banks, Madge Evans, and Helen Vinson, the story covers the life of an engineer and his monumental yet deadly quest from the 1940s to the 1960s. A group of wealthy businessmen hear engineer Richard McAllen's groundbreaking proposal to construct a transatlantic tunnel connecting Britain and the United States. As construction progresses, McAllen faces personal trials, including strained relationships and tragic losses. Amidst financial setbacks and the threat of a volcanic eruption on the Atlantic floor, he keeps going. The wavering support of his wife and his friend Robbie over the years test his resolve, but he ultimately achieves the colossal feat of completing the tunnel linking two continents. This would eventually become a reality, but on a much smaller scale. There are now underwater tunnels around the world, including a 31-mile tunnel connecting the UK and Europe, and a 33-mile tunnel in Japan. Throughout the film, the characters push the need for this tunnel for commerce between the United States and the United Kingdom, as well as the necessity for the two countries to remain strong allies no matter what. A not-so-subtle dig at Germany and the looming threat of war. The biggest strengths of this film are the visuals, set, and prop design, with cinematography by Gunther Krumpf and art direction by Enzo Metzner. The filmmakers used footage from the 1933 version of the film from director Curtis Bernhardt to complete the vision. The futuristic cars and trains were the visual highlights the cars were based on a 1934 Tatra 77, a Czechoslovakian design. There were innovations in the film that would eventually become reality, like video conferencing and wireless communication. The New York Times called the film, quote, an imaginative drama in the best Jules Verne tradition. Transatlantic Tunnel forges on through the years with such desperate courage that it enlists the spectator as an ally in the great experience." Unquote. The film itself is average. It's more melodrama than science fiction, but it does raise questions about how early in the decade Europeans knew they were headed towards war, as well as who was going to be allies with whom. There's a lot of talking, and not enough letting the visuals breathe and take the spotlight. Like many films I've researched for this series, 
the last 20 to 30 minutes are the most dramatic and the best use of the genre's potential. Transatlantic Tunnel is available on DVD, YouTube, and the Internet Archive. I'll link them in the description below. To a new world of gods and monsters. <laughs> Dr. Pretorius's words encompass the growing fears of science, man's hubris, and playing God. 1931's Frankenstein was such a success that Universal greenlit a sequel early on. After going through several directors and screenwriters, the sci-fi horror hybrid Bride of Frankenstein went into production on January 1935. Dr. Henry Frankenstein is coerced by a former colleague into creating a mate for the monster, hoping to end his reign of terror. The monster wanders the countryside meeting those who are horrified while one blind man sees him as a friend. When a bride is brought to life, she rejects him, triggering a violent rampage that culminates in the destruction of both creatures and the laboratory. Dr. Frankenstein barely escapes with his life, realizing the folly of playing God. Frankenstein and the Invisible Man director, James Whale, was recruited by Universal to direct the sequel. Whale had little interest since he thought there was little more of the story to explore. He eventually agreed to take the job after Universal let him direct a passion project, One More River, in 1934. Bride of Frankenstein would be his last science fiction slash horror film. He would completely change genres, directing Showboat in 1936. Whale didn't like the previous versions of the script, and it went through several writers until bringing on William Hurlbut, the playwright behind Lilies of the Field. The final script is a combination of various elements of accumulated drafts, as well as elements of black comedy that Whale desired. The idea of the Mary Shelley scene from the opening is one idea that carried through the various drafts. Colin Clive as Henry, whose book ending was changed in the first film, returns, along with Boris Karloff as the monster. Karloff had objections to the monster speaking. Valerie Hobson replaced Mae Clark as Elizabeth. Elsa Lanchester was cast as both the bride and Mary Shelley. In the American Cinematographer magazine article, The Bride of Frankenstein, a Gothic Masterpiece, we get some insight into James Whale's casting of Lanchester. Quote, A small but voluptuous woman with a fey kind of beauty and a ribald sense of humor. She also played the fragile Mary Shelley in the prologue. This was Whale's way of showing that even sweet Mary harbored a monster within, unquote. On some interesting side notes, Claude Rains, the Invisible Man star, was considered for the role of Pretorius, while Metropolis star Bridget Helm was considered for the bride. The advancements in sound and camera technology between the making of Frankenstein and this film allowed James Will to create a more hyperactive look. By 1935, post-production dubbing was available, letting Whale move the camera around the actors instead of remaining still. He was then able to dub the dialogue in post-production. The Hayes Code office objected to elements of the film, from the visibility of Mary Shelley's breast to the gruesomeness of the killings, as well as Henry comparing himself to God. The film also faced censorship in Britain and China. Though it made less than the original, the film was considered a success. With a reported final budget of around $400,000, it made about $2 million in its initial release, as well as re-releases. That's almost $34 million today. This is a well-made, engaging film. The production departments from costume, set design, and cinematography put this film in another league compared to the other sci-fi films of 1935. Jack Pierce's makeup was superb, taking the looks from the first film and adding burns and scars to Karloff's makeup. I wish we could have spent more time with the bride, and Karloff's monster is both heartbreaking and scary. Before you came, I was all alone. It is bad to be alone. Alone. Bad. Friend, good. 
Our title character would make another appearance in 1985's The Bride, starring Jennifer Beals and Sting. It was a critical and commercial failure. Boris Karloff would play the monster one more time in 1939's Son of Frankenstein. Lon Chaney Jr. would later take over the role. The Bride of Frankenstein is available on DVD, Blu-ray, and for free on Vimeo and the Internet Archive. I'll link the films and the article from the American Cinematographer in the description below. There are times when science inspires a film, and time when science is filmed and put on screen. 1935 saw a film so controversial, it was banned in England and pulled from a theatrical run in the United States. It then needed an explanation attached to its eventual 1938 release. To whom it may concern, the actual experiment of bringing the dead back to life, which is part of the motion picture Life Returns, was performed by myself and staff on May 22, 1934 at 11.45 p.m. in Berkeley, California. This part of the picture was originally taken to retain a permanent scientific record of our experiment. Everything shown is absolutely real. The animal was unquestionably and actually dead and was brought back to life. May I offer my thanks to my assistants, Mario Marguti, William Black, Ralph Kelmer, and Roderick Nieder, who are shown carrying out their respective parts, respectfully submitted Dr. Robert E. Cornish. Director Eugene Frank created the film around the 10 minutes of footage, and it was used in the climax of the film as the dog is brought back to life. From screenwriters Arthur T. Horman and John F. Goodridge, the film stars Onslow Stevens as John Kendrick, who we last saw in 1934's The Vanishing Shadow. Joining Stevens are George P. Brakeston, Louise Wilson, and Valerie Hobson, who also played Elizabeth in Bride of Frankenstein. Robert Cornish, the scientist who inspired the film, plays himself. Three colleagues work to develop a way of reviving the dead, despite skepticism from their professional colleagues. When Kendrick loses his wife, he falls into despair to the point of losing custody of his son, but he still believes in his experiments. After his son's dog Scooter is killed, he turns tragedy into triumph, resurrecting the dog and reuniting with his son. Director Eugene Frank thought the film was good enough to make a sequel, but I'm going to have to agree with Universal Pictures on this one, that it's best that this was one and done. When executives at Universal saw a preview of the film, they declared it a, quote, freak picture, not suitable for the regular Universal program. Frank then tried to sue Universal because the film didn't get a regular theatrical release. It did get a limited roadshow release, but failed to gain a lot of attention. It was finally shown in theaters in 1938 by Synart Pictures, a company that was possibly owned by Frank himself. This was one of those films where the behind-the-scenes story is way better than the actual film. It's fascinating to see that Universal made The Bride of Frankenstein and this film in the same year, both delving into themes of life, death, resurrection, and rebirth. It wanted to delve into themes of ambition and sacrifice for science, but it's just a boring film. The resuscitation footage isn't too graphic by today's standards. Life Returns is available on DVD as well as for free on YouTube and the Internet Archive. And I'll link them in the description below. Nineteen thirty-five saw the return of one of sci-fi's smallest subgenres, the science fiction musical, but this time mixed with the western. The Phantom Empire is considered the first sci-fi western and shows off Gene Autry in his first starring role. The madhouse now, the house is in cattle and south of the air, even the long jacket was there. Joining Autry is Frankie Darrow. Doing his own stunts, this former child actor would later become a stuntman. And some trivia for fans of 1950s sci-fi. 
In 1956, Dara would go on to work as one of the operators inside Robbie the Robot's suit in Forbidden Planet. And non-actor Betsy King Ross, a rodeo performer and champion trick rider, works alongside Dara as Gene Autry's loyal sidekicks. Writer Wallace McDonald claimed that the idea for this story came to him in the Dennis chair while high on nitrous oxide. But there are more literary influences from Jules Verne, as well as the Flash Gordon comic strips. The adventure follows Gene Autry, a singing cowboy who leads the show Radio Ranch, airing every day at 2 p.m. Autry and his pals Frankie and Betsy get swept into a thrilling journey, kidnapped by the mysterious Thunder Riders. They're taken away to the underground city of Morania. With futuristic gadgets and a queen who wants Jean Autry dead, battling both the high-tech Moranians and the above-ground villains who want the ranch. The serial was edited down into a 70-minute feature in 1940 and was also released under several titles including Radio Ranch as well as Men with Steel Faces. With a budget of $75,000, about $1.6 million today, the book, The Great Movie Serials, Their Sound and Fury by Jim Harmon said the serial was a, quote, marked box office success, unquote. This serial's fun and makes good use of the sci-fi genre, with its use of TV screens to spy on the above ground and the tech gadgets used by the Queen and her henchmen. Sure, the plot point of why Jean must get back to the ranch every day by 2 p.m., or else the property could be sold off, is an unusual but ridiculous way to create suspense between episodes. It is well made for its low budget, and the hidden underground city has some cool set design. The western part of the story wasn't as needed, but it seemed like a way to highlight Jean Autry. To me, Frankie and Becky are the real stars. The robots, on the other hand, are a bit over the top. They were made for the 1933 film The Dancing Lady starring Joan Crawford, but the scenes were cut from the film and repurposed for this project. The Phantom Empire is available on DVD, on the streaming service Tubi, and for free on YouTube as well as the Internet Archive. I'll link them in the description below. The Lost City is an independently made American 12-part serial directed by Harry Revere, who is best known for exploitation films. It stars William Stage Boyd, Kane Richmond, and Claudia Dell. This is not the William Boyd from Hopalong Cassidy fame. However, his alcoholism and difficulties on set, including showing up for filming on the final episode Drunk, would hurt both his and the more famous William Boyd's careers. The Lost City follows engineer Bruce Gordon and his friend Jerry as they travel to Africa to investigate global electrical disturbances and earthquakes. An evil scientist invented an earthquake machine to take over the world. The heroes soon find themselves entangled in a battle against the scientist. There are several versions of the series, including one edited into a four-hour feature, as well as one from the 1940s and the 1970s, retitled City of Lost Men. There isn't much of the way of sci-fi in this serial other than the contraptions and experiments within the Lost City itself. The earthquake machine could have been intriguing in the hands of better filmmakers. Overall, the production is poorly made, with random editing choices pointless storylines, and overt racism. The producers tried to get this into theaters before The Phantom Empire because of the competing stories of a hidden city. But that's where the comparisons end. Unfortunately, this is one of the few films I've researched for this series that I can't find a positive reason to recommend. The Lost City is available for free on YouTube, and I'll link it in the description below. Our final science fiction film of 1935, Air Hawks, from Columbia Pictures, is better known today as the only on-screen performance by American pilot and 1930s celebrity Wiley Post, who in 1933 completed a record-breaking flight around the world. 
On that historic flight, Post used two new devices, autopilot and a radio detection finder, devices widely used today. Unfortunately, Post and Hollywood star Will Rogers, who we discussed in 1931's A Connecticut Yankee, were killed in a plane crash in Alaska, three months after Air Hawks was released in theaters. Though Post was only on screen for a few minutes, his name was all over the promotional material. Director Albert Rogel had an interest in aviation, making several films on the subject. But this film was very light on the sci-fi elements, only being used as a weapon to kick the plot into action. The script was based on an unpublished story, Air Fury, by Ben Pivar, starring Ralph Bellamy, a prolific actor who would later work on His Girl Friday, Rosemary's Baby, and Pretty Woman. Barry Eldon, played by Bellamy, is the owner of an airline company. He competes with a rival for a lucrative air mail contract. However, his planes mysteriously crash due to a ray machine developed by a scientist working with the villain. With the government and public losing faith, Eldon races to uncover the source of the sabotage before it's too late. Wiley Post shows up at the end to help save the day. The film is just okay. The air sequences were the best part, while the rest was just average melodrama. It's a stretch to call this science fiction. The ray machine used to take down planes is the only element that puts it in this genre. Air Hawks is available on DVD and for free on both YouTube and the Internet Archive. I'll link it in the description below if you would like to check it out. The 1930s witnessed rising trends in science fiction literature, with authors increasingly exploring imaginative narratives, focusing on utopian visions, social critique, space voyages, and the possibilities of technological progress. Hidden World by Stanton A. Coblenz was published in serial form in Wonder Stories. Edgar Rice Burroughs published several works, including Lost on Venus in novel form and Swords of Mars in serial form for Blue Book. John Wyndham's novel, The Secret People, told the story of companions who find themselves captured after crashing into an island formed by a flooded Sahara, only to encounter a society ruled by a strict hierarchy. Some science fiction works published this year, beyond their influence on the genre itself, found their way into the world of feature films or television, either as direct adaptations or as sources of inspiration for future sci-fi cinematic ventures. Though the idea of alternate history as a science fiction subgenre may seem questionable to some, I do want to highlight Sinclair Lewis's novel, It Can't Happen Here, a chilling tale of a senator as he seizes power in the 1936 presidential election, ushering in a dystopian dictatorship. Through the eyes of a newspaper editor, readers witness the swift descent into authoritarianism with dissenters silenced and democracy under threat. MGM considered an adaptation the same year of the book's publication, but was canceled due to, quote-unquote, budget constraints. Though the real reason may lie in the studio not wanting to anger the German government because of potential references to their regime. After Charlie Chaplin initiated filming for The Great Dictator, the adaptation briefly resumed production. Regrettably, the film remained incomplete, but it inspired stage productions beginning in 1936 and a 1968 television movie titled Shadow on the Land. The book's influence extended to Kenneth Johnson, creator of beloved series such as The Bionic Woman and The Incredible Hawk, prompting him to write Storm Warnings, a narrative that later became the acclaimed 1983 miniseries V. Olaf Stapledon's Odd John, A Journey Between Jest and Earnest, introduces readers to the enigmatic figure of John endowed with superhuman capabilities such as telepathy and telekinesis, weaving themes of superiority, the complexities of human nature, and the existential quandaries of existence. Producer George Powell purchased the rights to the novel 
but it never went into production. David McCallum was rumored to star, but the film was never made. No part of history exists in a vacuum. Culture, history, science, the arts, and cinema are influenced by, as well as influence the course of history. And so, when looking at science fiction films of any time, it is important to understand what else was going on in the world. By looking back, we can recognize the events that set the stage for the upcoming global conflict at the end of the decade. Adolf Hitler began rearming Germany and initiated a military draft while also reinstating the Luftwaffe, all in violation of the Treaty of Versailles that ended World War I. Germany also introduced the Nuremberg Laws, a set of anti-Semitic laws aimed at discrimination against Jews and depriving them of basic rights and citizenship. Meanwhile, the Abyssinia Crisis, a conflict between Italy and Ethiopia from 1935 to 1936, was initiated by Italy's expansionist dictator, Benito Mussolini. Despite Ethiopia's pleas for help and sanctions imposed by the League of Nations, the League's failure to take decisive action due to internal divisions and appeasement policies weakened its credibility and ability to prevent further aggression. Some other notable historical events of the year include Amelia Earhart achieving an historic milestone on January 12th by completing the first solo flight from Hawaii to California, covering a distance of 2,408 miles, marking an extraordinary feat in aviation history. On September 2nd, the most powerful hurricane in U.S. history made landfall in the upper Florida Keys as a Category 5 storm, boasting winds of 185 miles per hour and claiming the lives of 423 people. In September, Howard Hughes achieved the remarkable feat of setting a new airspeed record of 352 miles per hour while flying the Hughes H1 racer, demonstrating significant achievements in aviation speed capabilities. In cultural and artistic events, the Parker Brothers Company started selling the game Monopoly in the United States. It quickly became a classic worldwide. On March 22nd, a historic milestone in television history was achieved when Fern St. Sender Paul Nipkoff, a German program, was transmitted, becoming the world's first regular television program. Presenting for the first time in radio, the amazing interplanetary adventures of Flash Gordon and Dale Arden. The iconic Flash Gordon radio serial made its debut, captivating audiences with thrilling adventures set in outer space. This innovative radio program became a sensation, influencing popular culture and inspiring future generations of science fiction storytelling. Swing music was gaining popularity, while Fred Astaire's Cheek to Cheek was the number one song in the United States. Written by Irving Berlin, it was featured in the film Top Hat. Together dancing cheek to cheek. And Alcoholics Anonymous was founded on June 10th in Akron, Ohio. Some scientific events and discoveries include on February 26, Sir Robert Watson Watt and Arnold Wilkins achieved a historic milestone by demonstrating the practical application of radar technology for detecting aircraft near Daventry, United Kingdom. This demonstration paved the way for the first radio detection of an aircraft by ground-based radar on June 17th. DuPont introduces nylon, a synthetic fiber that revolutionized the textile industry. Additionally, nylon's durability and strength made it an invaluable material for wartime applications, including parachutes, ropes, and military equipment, further solidifying its impact on both civilian and military sectors. Albert Einstein, Boris Poldolsky, and Nathan Rosen published a paper in 1935 questioning the completeness of quantum mechanics, proposing the EPR paradox to challenge our understanding of particle behavior. In advancements related to the film industry, 1935 marked a pivotal year for color film technology. These breakthroughs represented major strides 
beyond previous additive color methods, fueling the growing popularity in the late 1930s. Eastman Kodak introduced Kodachrome Subtractive Color Reversal Film as a 16 millimeter movie film, marking a significant advancement in color cinematography. This innovative film, invented by two Jewish musicians, Leopold Godowski and Leopold Mainz, allowed filmmakers to capture vibrant and lifelike color images. The introduction of Kodachrome opened new creative possibilities in filmmaking and became widely used in amateur and professional productions. Agfa released Agfa Cooler Noi, an innovative color film using new technology by Rudolf Fischer. Unlike older color films, Agfa Cooler Noi made processing easier because the color was already built into the film, eliminating the need for complicated development steps. In 1935, Hollywood witnessed major advancements in film technology and storytelling. RKO's Becky Sharp became the first feature-length film shot entirely in three-strip Technicolor, while Disney's The Band Concert introduced color to Mickey Mouse's adventures. There was a lot of potential for Technicolor's three-strip process for creating vibrant and lifelike colors. However, color filmmaking remained relatively expensive and complex, limiting its widespread use compared to black and white films. Despite this, the period saw a notable increase in the production and popularity of color films, laying the groundwork for their eventual dominance in the industry. When discussing science fiction films from 1935, it's essential to consider the broader context of the industry as a whole. And though this channel is about science fiction, I want to highlight some notable non-sci-fi films and industry milestones of the year. This is not an exhaustive discussion of the year, but just a snapshot of events. There were several controversies on the outskirts of the industry. This year saw the groundbreaking decision by the U.S. Treasury Department to back the Commissioner of Customs ruling to bar the entry of the 1933 Czechoslovakian film Ecstasy due to its controversial scenes of nudity and explicit sexual content, making this Hedy Lamarr film the first non-pornographic film to face such censorship in the United States. Triumph of the Will, a controversial film from Germany directed by Leni Riefenstahl, glorified the 1934 Nazi Party Congress in Nuremberg, effectively serving as Nazi propaganda. It sparked debates about the ethics of using film as a tool for political manipulation. In Hollywood news, 20th Century Pictures and Fox Film Corporation combined to create 20th Century Fox Film Corporation, becoming one of the industry's biggest studios. After several buyouts and mergers over the years, it is now owned today by Disney. Shirley Temple and Bill Robinson became the first interracial dance couple in The Little Colonel. This was the first year a certain gold statue was first referred to as Oscar. Mutiny on the Bounty won Best Picture for the films of 1935. John Ford won Best Director, and Victor McLaglen won Best Actor for The Informer, and Betty Davis won Best Actress for Dangerous. There was a single Academy Award nominee in the sci-fi genre, with Best Sound Recording nominee The Bride of Frankenstein. Some notable non-sci-fi films released in 1935 include this year's Best Picture winner, Mutiny on the Bounty. Directed by Frank Lloyd, it depicts the historical mutiny aboard the British ship HMS Bounty, led by Fletcher Christian against Captain William Bly, starring Clark Gable and Charles Lawton. Top Hat, a musical romantic comedy directed by Mark Sandrich. It follows a charming dancer played by Fred Astaire as he falls for the beautiful Ginger Rogers amidst mistaken identities and comedic misunderstandings set against the backdrop of glamorous dance sequences and timeless melodies. The 39 Steps, directed by Alfred Hitchcock, follows the journey of a man who becomes embroiled in a conspiracy after a woman is murdered in his apartment. As he races against time to clear his name and unravel the mystery, he encounters suspenseful twists and turns, 
leading to a thrilling climax. Social commentary on the current events of the time weighed heavily on filmmakers' minds in 1935. Across the world, storytellers grappled with the steps their governments were taking to ward war, creating darker dramas. But along the way, there were fun musicals, forgettable journeys, and lots of robots. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe for more History of Sci-Fi content, and I'll see you in 1936.